Hi everyone, so we are at 1 p.m. Pacific time now. Um, welcome to our tech talk on the science of spear phishing attacks. Uh, nice to see all these friendly faces coming in. Hi mom, hi dad, welcome to the webinar. Um, yes, I'm eating properly, we can talk later. Um, sorry folks, I'm not great at small talk, so I'm just trying to entertain you with these free bits while we wait for people to trickle in. Um, we'll get started in a few seconds. And the few seconds are up. So um, welcome everyone. Um, over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the science of spear phishing attacks. My name is Abhishek. I'm an Amnox employee uh, on the marketing team. I don't speak to you in a marketing capacity today though. Uh, in my spare time, I'm also an Amnox threat researcher. Um, so today I'm going to look at A, why phishing continues to be a problem even after we've received all these security awareness sessions. Uh, B, I'll try to delve into our minds a bit to see how phishing attacks target our brain more than they do any security system. And I'll end the session by highlighting some capabilities organizations should look for, or at least some questions that organizations should ask uh, while they try to build something new, or build a new modern email security stack. So let's begin. And we'll start by examining how phishing is still a big problem for every organization. So if we look at numbers from 2020, they paint a familiar, if slightly depressing picture. Um, the first stat over here, if you look at the FBI, they continue to receive a large number of complaints on phishing, um, smishing, farming, wishing, and other related attacks. They received close to 240,000 complaints in 2020 for these attacks, and it represented a 110% increase from the numbers over the previous year. Um, moving over to the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, phishing was the most common attacker tactic used in all breaches. Uh, it was involved in 36% of all breaches in 2020, and that was 11% increase from the previous year. And according to the excellent Verizon DDR team, 11% increase is very much statistically significant. And the last stat over here is also interesting because it's not meant as a dig at security awareness programs, but more as a realization that they are not sufficient by themselves. Uh, the Scientia Institute found that 14% of users who received five or more phishing training sessions still ended up clicking on phishing links. Um, so all of these stats relate to phishing, but in my mind, they signify one thing, that it's easy for humans to take the blame for falling prey to phishing attacks, but it's not the right thing. Um, we say human error, the word human is in it. So we also need to make sure that Humans are not constantly taken out of their daily behaviors. The cost of their mistakes whenever they happen is reduced. And that we take a more sympathetic approach rather than blaming the end user every time for falling for phishing attacks. Um, moving on, so if we double click on stats for particular industries, we find that phishing attacks uh, don't leave any industry behind. Um, few industries here with a variety of end users and stakeholders like education and public administration are beset by socially engineered attacks. Uh, edu higher education and K-12 and universities, for example, have stakeholders that are not tech savvy at all, like young folks and maybe even some adult educators. And then they have security teams that aren't tech savvy. So there's a widespread here and there is a likelihood of falling prey to socially engineered attacks. Um, the other trend here is industries that are responsible for critical public infrastructure, or maybe industries that are going through digital transformation like manufacturing, mining, quarrying, oil and gas, they are also prime targets for email compromise. Um, and it's even worse because compromise there can cause real havoc in, uh, in society outside the digital world. So it's clear that phishing is still a problem, um, but why do we still fall for phishing attacks after all those security awareness sessions and after email security uh, as a market being around for uh, years, if not decades? So rather than kind of pointing fingers again, I'm going to uh, take an inward look in this section and see how in some ways we are destined to fall for phishing attacks. It's a matter of when, not if. So a um, bit of a left field turn here, but in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he talks about two modes of thinking. Um, system two thinking is a mode where our brains are slow, rational, methodical, and they always uh, it always thinks before it acts. Um, I liken this to driving a car for the first time or learning how to drive. 
you're acutely aware of every lane change, every indicator, every press on the accelerator or brake. This is also how security awareness programs train us to think like while reviewing emails. But there is a problem here, and the problem is system one thinking. Um, system one thinking is a mode where our brains are fast, uh, instinctive, and they act or click before they think in, when we are in this mode of thinking. Um, you can liken this to experienced drivers just driving along the straight freeway. And uh, people in the know would know how scary it feels when you accidentally zone out on the freeway and something bad almost ends up happening. So I think we are that zoned out when we see our inboxes more often than not. Um, system one thinking is how we actually think while reviewing emails in our overcrowded inbox. When we click that link or respond to that email from our CEO asking us for gift cards, it's a different part of our brain that is telling us to do that, not the part that is trained on security awareness programs. So that's where security awareness programs is a necessary but not sufficient um, solution to the phishing problem. Um, and clearly, I'm a doctor, so you should trust me on all this system one versus system two thinking stuff. So let's take a deeper look. Let's look at some cognitive biases that um, are commonly exploited by phishing attacks. Uh, I should know because marketing also usually exploits these biases, full disclosure. Um, there are five main cognitive biases that we end up seeing. Um, the first one being a halo effect. The halo effect is where we have a preconceived positive notion of someone, whether it is a person, brand, or service provider. Um, the second is hyperbolic discounting. You must have seen this used in many clickbait ads. Uh, email attacks also exploit the, the same tendency. Uh, the, our need to choose rewards that have immediate results. Uh, moving on to the next one, that's the curiosity effect. Uh, you must have seen this while going through a BuzzFeed article about 23 cat gifts and the third one will blow your mind or something like that. So our desire to see more and resolve uncertainty in our minds is something that uh, spear phishing attacks exploit a lot. Moving on to the next one, it's uh, the recency effect. So the recency effect is when we tend to remember and act on things that are top of mind for us. Uh, I can give one very relevant example here for spear phishing attacks, and that's COVID-19. Over the last year and a half, uh, the Armablox threat research team has observed a vast number of COVID-themed email scams, um, whether they be tech support scams, folks impersonating the doctor's office with test results, uh, attackers impersonating the IRS to give you COVID tax relief, and so on. Anything with a COVID context tends to get clicked on, however fake it might seem. Because as the previous slide, as I talked about in the previous slide, we're not really thinking straight. We take a look at these emails. And the last bias is the authority bias, which is our tendency to defer to the opinions of and request from authority figures. So let's uh, take a look at each of these biases in a bit more detail. Uh, what I'm going to do with, over the course of the next few slides is go through some specific examples uh, that the Amoblox threat research team has seen that align with all of these biases. And there are links to all of these examples. So when you get the deck later after the session, um, feel free to click through on these. They all lead to uh, more deeper threat research where you can find out more details about these attacks. Um, so let's start with the halo effect, which appears in 29% of phishing attacks, according to research from Security Advisor. The first example here is a QuickBooks impersonation that we saw a few months ago. Uh, QuickBooks is incidental, but any trusted tax software or service provider um, usually can send you emails asking you to review your last deposit um, or checking that your account is locked or not, whether everything is up to date any automated email workflow from a service provider that you trust, basically. And these often lead to login pages where they ask for your credentials. And then when you enter your credentials quickly, then the attacker takes them and then causes follow on chaos. The second example here is a FedEx impersonation and phishing attack. So we have seen a huge rise in um, attacks impersonating shipping companies like FedEx, DHL. Um, if you click the link here, it will uh, lead to a, an article that has both, the, both of these attacks. In fact. And I think why we've seen such a sudden rise in this particular type of attack is we do tend to get a lot of emails from online shipping companies now uh, in lockdown, whether it's our package um, being on the way or uh, allowing us to track our package or files being securely transferred um, from a coworker or a colleague and so on. Um, and the last example here is how email security technologies can also fall for the halo effect. 
Uh, we have often seen attackers use trusted software like Google Sites, Google Firebase, Google Forms, Typeform, and so on to host phishing pages. And because the parent domain is legitimate, there is a halo effect on any URL filter or block list and so on. And then these URLs just make their way into inboxes. So that's a bit about the halo effect. Uh, next, let's look at parabolic discounting. Sorry, uh, slip of the tongue, hyperbolic discounting. Um, parabolic discounting is when your geometry textbook has a huge sale goal, but we are talking about hyperbolic discounting today, uh, which is when things are too good to be true. Uh, this bias gets exploited in around 28% of phishing attacks, according to the same research. So a few notable examples to call out here. Uh, the first one is an IRS COVID relief phishing scam. And here, just like the Google Forms example on the previous slide, the phishing page was more an information collection form posted on SharePoint. And again, it's it's very easy for people to fall for these uh, attacks if the link has not been blocked automatically, which in this case it hasn't because it's a SharePoint. Um, the second one is a Black Friday scam where the scam was not really, the end goal of the scam was not really to steal any information or steal money, but just to sell counterfeit goods to end users. So this was a Ray-Ban scam where the attackers set up an entire fake website with all goods being 90% off. Um, but all the goods were clearly fake. So around uh, there are certain time-bound events like Prime Day or Black Friday where marketers anyways use hyperbolic discounting. So I know it's easy, much, much easier said than done, but please keep in mind um, not to fall for hyperbolic discounting when it's maybe by marketers too, but especially by cyber criminals because they use the, the same workflows to um, get you to do things for that. Um, the last example here is uh, an invoice fraud. So here, attacker, the attacker impersonated a vendor and they shared out of turn payments or returns that turn out to be fraudulent. This example also uh, was hosted on Google Firebase. So it, it relates to how the, the halo effect and how email security technologies can also fall for the halo. Uh, moving on to the curiosity effect, which is our need to know more about something and uh, resolve uncertainty. This appears in 17% of phishing attacks. Um, the first very famous example actually was a large scale spear phishing attack launched by Nobelium. Nobelium was the same threat group that was behind um, the solar winds attack. So uh, the FBI and CISA released an alert a few months ago uh, talking about how Nobelium was perpetrating a large scale spear phishing attack that claimed to come from USAID, which is a US agency, and it had it claimed to have uh, information about election fraud. Now, whichever side of the political divide you lay on, something about election fraud makes you want to click, makes you want to know more about it. And I think this phishing attack successfully targeted um, 7,000 companies um, across multiple industries. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very famous example. Um, the next example here is a very common one. Uh, Wells Fargo is the bank that we're highlighting on the screen, but a locked account workflow is something that exploits the curiosity effect because you usually get these emails from attackers pretending to be banks or other service providers informing you that your account has been locked due to suspicious activity. Uh, and they either ask you to call a number or they ask you to click a link to make sure your account is working correctly. Um, so you do want to make sure your account is working correctly, especially if it's linked to your paycheck. And there is another theme at play here alongside the curiosity effect, um, which has a hint of irony in it, which is that security themes are often used as social engineering techniques by attackers. So ironically, in our need to be more secure, we tend to act on emails talking about locked account workflows or suspicious email activity much quicker. So attackers just use that same language in their scams. Um, and yeah, I mentioned phishing earlier. So another common variant of the curiosity effect is uh, voice phishing scams. So over recent months, we have seen a huge rise in voice phishing scams, especially related to tech support and customer support from online shopping companies. Uh, this example is from Amazon and it shares an online order without any links. Uh, there is an HTML button in the email, but it's just the PNG. The button doesn't read to anything. The only call to action in that email is the number that you can call. And the number has a real human at the end of the line that tries to steal as much information from you as possible. So the other way spear phishing attacks attack humans rather than any security system is just by using email as the entry point and then quickly 
taking you to either a phone or some other medium where security technologies can't follow the threat. The next example we looked at is the recency effect. So something that is top of mind for us. Uh, this appears in 5% of phishing attacks according to the research, but I mean, here the numbers are more uh, ballpark rather than exact because we do see a, a combination of cognitive biases used in, in most social engineering attacks and spear phishing attacks that we see. Um, so the first example here, I won't spend too much time on because I already mentioned the COVID test results in a previous scam, in a previous slide rather. Uh, so yeah, this email, Claim to have COVID test results, but it actually installed a malicious file on the victim system. Um, the second example here is an automated email coming from a cloud office software claiming that a file was shared with you by a colleague. So messages like this, we get plenty of legitimate messages like this every day. Someone has shared a file with you on SharePoint or through B-Transfer or through Google Docs and so on. So by replicating that same uh, workflow, the attackers almost force us to tap our system one thinking part of our brains. Um, and the last one is payroll fraud. So payroll fraud is when an attacker impersonates an employee and emails the payroll team with fake direct deposit information. So it's essentially wage theft. What we have observed is these emails always go out either on payday or the day before payday, because that is when uh, this is top of mind for payroll team. So they it's likely that they won't look at the email too closely and they just change the direct deposit information and there goes the page. And the last bias that we look at is the authority bias. So I should probably do what, what they say is, is what your kid is telling. Um, so here, the first example is an email from Verizon support asking you to view an urgent security message. So uh, again, it's not just the authority bias here. It's also the halo effect because Verizon is someone that you trust. It's also the curiosity effect because, oh, what is this urgent security message? Maybe I want to know more about it. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a confluence of various cognitive biases, but it is a very common um, attack technique or workflow technique that we observe. Um, second one, bit absurd, but uh, people still do fall for it. People uh, Attackers impersonating the Supreme Court or any other government. So this email claimed to come from the Supreme Court and served the victim with a subpoena. When they click the link, it actually went to a recapture page, then it went to another redirect, and then it went to uh, a login form, an O365 login page for whatever reason. But um, yeah, that was an attack that we saw a few months ago, I think late 2020. And uh, the last one is probably the most famous example of authority bias uh, being used in email attacks, which is the iTunes gift card scam. So emails from your CEO, that usually come to you maybe a week after you've joined, you're remote, you still don't know everyone else in your organization. Um, someone claiming to be the CEO will send you an email and ask you to either give you uh, give them your credit card details, so buy iTunes gift cards and so on. And there is no URL in the scene. So it's purely language-based and that's why again, it tends to get past uh, many traditional email security controls. Just keeping a slight check on time here, I think we do have enough time. So the last section is where we go from here. Um, hopefully, I've provided some insight into why people still fall for phishing attacks, the human part of the problem, not really the technology part of the problem or the process part of it. Um, I will now take um, a look at how email security technology needs to change, our view on it at least, uh, to protect people, reduce the likelihood of their mistakes, and reduce the cost of those mistakes whenever they happen by catching things in transit before they become uh, too harmful to everyone. So the first is uh, how we look at email threat detection. It needs to change because as you must have seen from all the examples I shared in like the five or six slides before this, we can't just rely on headers or metadata uh, or other binary signals like that because yeah, attackers can just flip one of 100 different switches they have and then that email will make it past uh, the policy that you have in place. So we need to make sure that email security technologies analyze many more signals than they do um, and learn from baselines whenever possible. So the three broad buckets we think are important to um, take email threat detection forward are uh, identity, number one, so who users are, their name and role, email authentication checks, which do have a role, but they are not sufficient, uh, alternate email addresses, any nicknames and signatures and so on. Um, the second bucket is behavior or what users do. So communication patterns, uh, domain communication frequency, 
where do they commonly log in from, who they commonly speak to, and so on. Which vendors do they commonly communicate with, uh, and so on. And the last and probably most important bucket is language, or how users communicate, because lots of the payload in spear phishing attacks nowadays and, and socially engineered attacks is in the language. It's in the form of a deadline or an urgent request or some financial matter being discussed. So if email security technologies are able to anal analyze writing styles and patterns, topics of communication, sensitive and confidential data at rest in inboxes or in transit, uh, and other fraud signifiers um, by learning across organizations, that's going to help raise the bar for cyber criminals to, to launch their, uh, the spear phishing attacks of today and tomorrow. Um, to end on this slide, no one signal is deterministic while looking at targeted email attacks today. So it follows that we can't rely too much on any one detection technique. It has to be a combination of best in class techniques uh, that will take us forward. The next thing, on our, our next point of view here is um, email security deployment and architecture and how that is poised for change. I think battle lines are already being drawn in camp inline versus camp API. Um, we believe that with most organizations using cloud-delivered email today, using an API-based email security augment um, is simpler, uh, doesn't make you double pay for what you've already paid for with either Microsoft or Google native email security. And it also eliminates some of the ongoing issues with inline security tools. So firstly, this type of deployment is fast. It usually takes minutes. Uh, you don't need to change your MX records or read out your emails uh, for this to happen. It's more compatible with native email security. And because it's fast, simple, and more compatible, security teams spend less time on the day-to-day -day maintenance. So they can free up their time to do other things that they were hired to do. Maybe within email security, maybe outside. Uh, lastly, how email security solutions learn uh, needs a change of mindset because learning from threat signifiers and IOCs across organizations is of course a good idea. But just like with email authentication checks uh, and with security awareness, it can be part of the foundation, but it can't be the entire building because targeted email attacks today weaponize the context of a particular organization or sometimes of a particular user. Um, so you're not always going to see large scale attack campaigns across hundreds of thousands of customers. So alongside a global set of models that learns um, from advanced attacks launched across organizations. Security solutions, email security solutions should ideally learn from organization specific data, which domains the organization commonly communicates with, which vendors they communicate with and so on, as well as user specific data. Like uh, I as a user, who do I commonly communicate with in armor blocks among my colleagues? Which vendors do I communicate with? How often do I communicate with them? What topics do I have to share commonly? Um, so a confluence of learning of, from all of this data can continue to stop large-scale attack campaigns, but it also increases the ability to stop highly targeted email attacks that were made especially for you. Um, so we're almost at the end. I think we do have some time for questions. Um, I'll end with a slide about ammo blocks. Uh, we help organizations communicate more securely over email using the power of natural language understanding um, and other algorithms. I did mention a few uh, slides ago, uh, no one algorithm or detection technique is the panacea. Um, we connect over APIs and analyze thousands of signals to understand the content and context of communications. And we help organizations in three main ways. Uh, firstly, inbound email protections, stopping targeted email attacks, whether they have malicious links, zero day links, or no links at all. Um, the second is protecting sensitive data, PII and PCI from falling into the wrong hands over email. Um, and the third is reducing phishing response times and saving time for the security team by automating away a lot of the user reported uh, email threat response process. Uh, we have over 56,000 customers today and largely uh, the, the two main quantifiable areas where Amoblox value has already manifested is a reduction in user reported email threats because Amoblox already uh, detects these threats in the inbox and a reduction in phishing response times between 75 to 97%. So that is freed up time for the security teams to do other things that they uh, were hired to do. Um, I'll end on this slide. If you found something useful in this 30 minute session, then follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and subscribe to our mail updates. 
Uh, we'll be releasing something cool, uh, or we think it's cool at least, next week, called the BEC Brigade. So if you want to learn more about different types of BEC or business signal compromise attacks and have some fun along the way, uh, stay tuned and it'll be releasing the week of September 27. Um, so thank you for attending this session. Uh, the floor is open for questions. I think we have five minutes remaining. Does anyone have any questions? Let me check. There are a few questions coming in here. Um, analyzing context and conversational data makes sense. Can you share implications, uh, if any, on cost resources to analyze all email conversations? So that's a good question. I think a lot of it uh, depends on the initial uh, baseline building. So I can take Amo Blocks as the example. Um, after connecting to a customer's email environment, Amo Blocks analyzes email archives for the last six months, and it brings baselines based on that analysis. Uh, those baselines help us to understand um, the context of communications for every customer, and then help us identify deviations from those baselines as well. So it's there are no cost implications there. It usually, for very large organizations, the initial training takes around uh, two weeks, but sometimes it takes days as well. It really depends on the number of mailboxes you have. Uh, and then after that, the models are trained on an ongoing basis. Um, we have another question coming up here. Uh, you shared information about wishing uh, earlier. So can you share more info about wishing uh, attacks and how they get past email security? Um, so in addition to what I shared before, a couple of ways in which wishing is unique. So firstly, there's no URL. So there's no filter for the email to get blocked in. Um, secondly, so the payload is the phone number. So phone numbers, are not an indicator of compromise that the security community is tracking today in any scalable manner. Maybe it will never be because, uh, I mean, you can create phone numbers using Google Voice, phone numbers change hands all the time and so on. So uh, that's, I think, another reason why wishing attacks make it pass because tracking that as an IOC is tricky. And thirdly, it's kind of an omni-channel attack, right? Email is just the entry point, but after that, the human, the victim is an active part of the workflow and no security technology can follow you on your phone. So that's another reason why um, there's a lack of visibility there with phishing attacks. Uh, three more minutes left, so we can take a few more questions. Uh, Rip Van Winkle here has a message that is just a series of Zs, so I guess he's sleeping. Um, there is one more question here on how established or accurate is NLU for detecting threats? That's a good question. Um, so NLU is, a very new technology, but like most disruptive technologies, it has gone through an inflection point. So a couple of years ago, um, NLU models have this thing called GLUE, General Language Understanding and Evaluation, which is almost like a, a, a reading comprehension test that measures how well the NLU model does compared to a human baseline. The human baseline is around 87. So for many years, the NLU models, for uh, the GLUE scores for NLU models were around 50, 60, hovering around that point. But then now with models like GPT-3, uh, which is by Google, BERT, which are I think initially piloted by Facebook and so on, um, NLU models approach human baselines and sometimes even exceed them. I think some of the armor blocks NLU models exceed human baselines. So it is very much poised to tackle state-of-the-art cybersecurity issues and uh, make sure that language can be used as a signal and not just um, be considered in a very heavy-handed way. Um, two more minutes left. Any other questions? We are planning to migrate to Office 365. How does Armblocks integrate with uh, Office 365? Uh, so yeah, we uh, integrate very seamlessly with Office 365 over APIs. Um, we, are a, a, we have a strong relationship with Microsoft. So we also have a uh, listing on the Azure marketplace. So if you have leftover Azure credits, you can um, use them um, to invest in Armblocks and we see ourselves as a post-Microsoft layer of protection. So Armablocks does not analyze emails before your EOP or MSTO does. Uh, and we are purpose-built to stop the highly advanced email attacks that make it past your native security controls. Um, the other thing to add there, I guess, is we deliberately don't do and don't plan to do some of the things that Microsoft already does very well, like anti spam for example. EOP already does that. You get it by default with Office 365. So we don't want to duplicate what you're already paying for. Uh, we see it more as an augmenting or a complementary relationship. Um, so I have just one minute left here uh, and I don't see any other questions. Um, this is from Madhuram Ayer, not a question, but more a comment. 
proud of you. Keep doing what you do. Thank you, mom. But I told you, don't talk in the webinar. I'll get in touch with you later. Um, so yeah, hope you had fun during this session. We'll share the recording and the slides with you on that LinkedIn event page later today. Uh, hope to see you on the internet again sometime. Thank you, everyone.